Hello and welcome to the Grain Farmers of Ontario Grain Talk webinar. This edition of our webinar is to discuss pests to watch out for in the coming weeks as the 2022 growing season progresses. I'm Laura Ferrier, agronomist with Grain Farmers of Ontario, and joining me today also from Grain Farmers of Ontario, we have Marty Vermey, Senior Agronomist, and Mike Buttonham, Sustainability and Environment Lead. And our special guest today is Tracy Bouty. Tracy is an entomologist for, for field crops with Ridgetown um, and out of with Omafra. Tracy's areas of focus are to collaborate on applied research and demonstration projects to validate, determine practical integrated insect management solutions, to monitor and implement strategies for new invasive species and develop management strategies. And she is the current chair for the Canadian Corn Pest Coalition. Tracy, thank you so much for joining us today and we can't wait to hear what you have to share. Thanks so much for having me. And um, it's the end of, or almost the end of June. So it is a bit of a crapshoot as to what possible issues uh, could happen. But I, because I also always feel like I'm being so pessimistic and pointing out all these possible concerns. But at the same time, I'm hoping, um, based on what we're seeing, I, I point out a few of the potential issues we may be seeing. Um, but sadly, there'll probably be others. <laughs> um, but first, I do want to talk about uh, a little bit about the things that we're, we're still currently seeing. So um, initially, we've been having um, cereal leaf beetle. And surprisingly, it was pretty low numbers, thankfully, in winter wheat for the most part. Um, and that's partly, I think, because we had some aphids in them in the, in the cereal crop early. And that allowed for a lot of the ladybugs to also be present and start feeding on um, any of the potential eggs and larvae that were being laid. But we are starting to finally see the population build up a little bit. So I am um, concerned a bit about the cereal, a spring cereal crop. And so some who are not familiar with uh, cereal leaf beetle, it's mainly the larva that we're worried about. And um, you can identify them because uh, they actually coat themselves in their own fecal matter. So they do, may, they do look like a shiny black, um, almost tiny little slug moving along the leaf. Um, and usually if you do wear khaki pants or even sadly your legs <laughs> when you wear shorts, you may get actual streaks of fecal matter on your legs um, in scouting. And if you do, if you do see that when you leave the field, go back in because they're likely there. Um, it, but there's usually initially the adults that are laying the eggs and that give way to the larva. But the adults don't do as much damage um, as the uh, larva do. So when it comes to their feeding, um, and that's that tiny uh, slug-like uh, larva that I'm talking about, they feed on the leaf tissue, especially the upper surface between the veins. So you will see the scratching, long scratch marks. And um, from a distance, the field can actually start to look a bit frosted or um, silver in appearance. And if it's to that level, it's um, pretty bad. But really, the, the key focus is looking for, one, their presence still at this time of year, um, and two, if they're actively feeding. So I see, I know um, that uh, there were a few fields. Um, Deb Campbell posted on Twitter, uh, Spring Cereal seeing this. Usually, before heading, you're looking at the number that's there. So before boot, though most are booting by now, um, the average is three larvae per tiller. After boot, but before heading, it's one adult or larva per stem in the crop. So, and you usually can see the scratch marks first and then look for the larva. But while you're in early heading um, until about grain fill, you're really focusing on that flag leaf. And if you see any feeding on the flag leaf, uh, that is a concern because the flag leaf gives 75% of the energy to the head during grain fill. So that is really what you need to protect. But it, you have to make sure they're still actively feeding. So look to see if they're there in the field. Um, hopefully, for the most part, most of the fields will not have this issue, but um, don't assume that spring cereals are in the clear this year. One positive thing is samples we collected last year um, that we sent to Ag Canada in Saskatchewan it looks like there's a, a new parasitoid that hasn't been identified here in Canada before that was released in the, the US that seems to be here in Ontario. So 
um, that gives hope that uh, we do have some beneficial still that are helping us with this pest. So as long as we're not having to spray too often um, in this crop as well as around in other crops in, in the year, um, we can help build those beneficials up, which is a, a good thing. So moving on, um, some of the things that we expect. Well, surprisingly, corn borer is starting to show up in other crops. Um, yes, there's, there are more fields now of non-BT corn um, and organic production, but also the other crops that we're growing. Um, everyone forgets that corn borer is a, a um, pest of many. So not only corn, but hemp, cannabis, quinoa, apples, uh, beans, it's almost endless. There's over 200 hosts. So we want to start tracking that. We're so focused on what it does in corn. We, we're not able to give as good a guidance on the other crops. And because of the resistant po population that took place in Nova Scotia to Cry1F, we want to start to watch it more on a landscape level. So we do have a survey. And so we want to point out um, we've worked across Canada to create this standardized survey to look for it in any host crop. So if, if you stumble across anything, it can be corn, but um, any other crop that you're looking or growing, um, let us know and, and take and capture some of that data for us because um, we, we really want to move away from just looking at what it does only in the context of BT corn, um, because that could change too. So um, just wanted to give you a heads up on that and more information on that is in on field crop news as well. So moving, since I'm in corn, um, the next thing I wanna point out is it's, it's time to put, be putting up your Western Maine cutworm traps, um, monitoring that over the season. We have uh, traps of other pests currently on the Great Lakes and Maritime Pest Monitor Network. Um, including now we have Indiana and uh, Wisconsin data that's going in there. We are seeing a second flight of true army room right now. Thankfully, we didn't have much of an outbreak in cereals this year, um, but uh, we just have to keep an eye. And especially if, um, if it ends up in corn later, uh, we, we should uh, be monitoring. So uh, Great Lakes it's, and Mar Maritime's Pest Monitor Network is still like it always has been. Um, we accept anyone putting up trap data into it. Um, we currently have about the same as last year, about two, uh, 230 traps, but uh, that usually increases once everyone's starting to monitor Western Bean. But obviously we have uh, corn borer traps on it as well, black cutworm, true armyworm, fall armyworm, and corn earworm uh, traps. So that's probably your best route to look and see what is going on here and uh, neighboring U.S. states too. And on, of course, Field Crop News, I have all the information you need on how to use that network, as well as the trapping instructions for each of the pests um, that you may be interested in monitoring for. But this is really where I want to focus some of my time today. Um, I think it's still going to be a good rootworm year. Uh, it looks like their emergence has been a little delayed, surprisingly, given the heat that we've been having. So we may have you know, an extended feeding period into later in the summer than we're used to. But this BT resistant issue isn't gonna go away. And I suspect we're still going to see more of it creeping into other counties as well. We now know of a unexpected damage case that was in Middlesex County last year. So it's not just a Huron, Perth, um, bit of Bruce area, it is expanding. And I think I also really want to see some focus on Eastern Ontario um, because we're seeing some abundant numbers in Quebec in particular. And Eastern Ontario is unique in that you have quite uh, abundance of Eastern, or sorry, uh, Northern corn rootworm in Eastern Ontario that um, uh, may be going uh, unnoticed. Um, and so I think we should focus our efforts, especially on continuous corn, uh, to monitor for this pest. Of course, um, you've seen these kind of slides before, but um, in it can just take the first year of continuous corn acres to get hit hard with um, rootworm. Um, what I'm meaning is the first time a grower ever experiences uh, resistant rootworm, it's bad. Um, he may be a continuous corn grower or she um, for many years, um, but if your neighbor has the problem too, um, it's shared across the, the um, area. And so you can lose 
you know, 50% or more of your silage um, in, in a, the first time you've experienced it. Uh, so it is something that we really should pay attention to. Again, I mentioned there's Western corn rootworm, uh, which is the yellow and black striped, um, but also Northern. And we used to have this concept that Northern was mainly in only Eastern Ontario, but thanks to the trap network that we've been doing, the distribution is, is pretty, it stretches across Ontario um, and we're seeing both present in the same fields. So that's um, something that we're learning from, but also indicates that we are at risk of either or both developing resistance to uh, the Bt proteins. Last year, as I mentioned, here's the, the Western uh, distribution in Ontario, which we um, somewhat expected, though it's, it tends to not be considered to be in Eastern. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, Quebec is really dealing with he heavy populations. So I think we're, we're going to start seeing that moving into uh, Ontario as well from their end. Um, but also Northern, where we thought it was only exclusively in Eastern, um, but it is even down in Southwestern Ontario. So uh, again, it's beneficial for us to be trapping and monitoring for this pest. From last year's network, which was really a huge success given we just started the trap network um, last year, we had 600 uh, trap sites um, across 15 states and provinces. And it did indicate that some counties in Ontario are at higher risk. So as mentioned, Huron, Perth, but even Stomont, Central Ontario, Stomont, Dundas, um, and Glengarry, and Bruce, and Northumberland, Wellington, uh, Lennox. So we shouldn't just assume it's only around Blythe that uh, we are monitoring for. Um, it, this is a report that I put together last year. You can get it um, on Field Crop News, but I'm also happy to distribute it uh, again to anyone who wants it. Um, but the majority of our sites here in Ontario were in corn, um, and, and many of them had either both northern and western um, or um, western corn rootworm. And there were uh, up to uh, 13 sites that had um, problem fields that we think were at high enough levels um, to be a concern. So um, I think this, the network is a great way of kind of indicating where these problem fields may be and continuing to keep an eye on it and being able to help um, have data to show the importance of moving away from corn for a year. So the trap network is running again this year. We've got all 17 states and provinces that are um, going to monitor. And thanks to the funding from Grain Farmers of Ontario and Abstec, we've got traps to give away. So if anyone hasn't contacted me yet for traps, please um, contact me. Uh, happy to send you traps to um, monitor in continuous cornfields this year. It's not too onerous, a little messy maybe, um, but we place four sticky traps about um, 50 meters apart or uh, preferred anyway. Uh, down one row of, of corn, you tie them to the corn stalk near the ear uh, and you check and change them weekly for a uh, six to eight week period, starting around R1. Um, so we've got a few weeks still yet to go. Important thing is really try and stick to a seven day interval, you know, give or take a few days. I, we had some uh, sites that were putting out traps, but then didn't go check them for 40 days. And we can't really rely on uh, the data from those traps because the beetles can move off of them, um, having the chance of being on that, that sticky trap for that long. But also they, they're really hard to ID once they get really glued in on there. Um, so, so, you know, if you're going to do this, stick to about a seven day window um, so we can get some clear data on what's going on. The positive thing, I know our biggest issue was uh, how to put the data into the system. We've changed it. So anyone who is familiar with putting trap data into the Great Lakes uh, and Maritimes network will have no problem with this transition. We've made it into a web-based application. Instead of using that um, survey one, two, three field app link that you had to use before. So it's now a permanent site um, where you just go into uh, the trap entry tab and start entering data. But of course, we have instructions, very thorough instructions. You just scroll through the tab 
um, to see, uh, to talk your way through it. Um, but we will also provide some demo videos shortly um, on how to do it. But essentially you go under trap entry, uh, data trap entry site. Um, you can um, put a dot on the map where your trap site is. And if, of course, you don't want to um, disclose where that site is, just put it near the nearest town. Um, and then give us a trap name and how many traps you're monitoring. And then um, each week you will see uh, your dot you will go back to and get a link where you can now go to uh, enter your field information and then one time, so hybrid, what crop type it is, et cetera. And then um, go back weekly to that same dot and enter your weekly trap counts. And it's from there, it just asks you the date, that uh, the new date for the week and the number of beetles you're seeing on each of the traps that you've indicated are gonna be in that field. Um, and then we will obviously uh, map it on a per day, per trap basis. So we really do see when peak adult activity is happening and where those problem fields are. There's also a regional corn rootworm uh, IPM site that Iowa State put together that all of this network um, participants uh, have provided information for. So uh, that is at um, cornrootwormipm.org, uh, or you can also just Google corn, uh, corn rootworm IPM Iowa State, and you'll get that site as well um, for additional information. Um, but we're really excited that hopefully that transition makes it a lot easier for people to enter data in and um, we'll get some some clear picture of what's going on uh, this year because I do feel it's going to be another good rootworm year. But going back to how we solve this problem, it's never going to go away. And the real uh, the reason why they're building up to high levels is the continuous corn. Um, they their larva need corn roots to survive. So in first year corn, not a problem because you still need the adults to come in and lay some eggs in that field. Second year corn possibly starts to build up levels, but really it's the third and fourth year that you start to see real issues because you're continuing to give those larvae um, a chance to survive. If you were to break that cycle and grow a non corn crop for one year, you essentially start back from scratch when it comes to rootworm populations. So it takes the first year corn, you really don't need protection from rootworm um, because you don't have larva to, to um, feed on those roots in there. Second year, maybe, but it's a matter of having monitored first year, especially using sticky traps and know, do I, are my populations too high or not? Um, and it's a way to avoid having to use BT corn rootworm hybrids in that second year too. So really first and second year, there's likely other options for you. Um, though first year you wouldn't need any at all. It's the third year that really you focus your protection of uh, using a BT hybrid and leave the other years for other possible management strategies, um, including biocontrol nematodes, for example, or if, we, if um, the availability is there with insecticide um, boxes or closed systems um, applying a soil insecticide. Um, but again, the risk is mainly third year. And we can only get to this kind of sustainable management if we go out of corn for a year in those fields to break that rootworm cycle. So that is really our approach to um, kind of help solve this BT resistant issue if we're going to maintain their uh, effectiveness at all. Because um, if we continue to just go solely BT hybrids uh, as a rootworm management strategy, we won't have effective products left um, to manage this pest. The other important thing is to report any signs of unexpected damage. If you've grown a BT rootworm hybrid and you see signs of uh, goosenecking, um, high numbers of beetles, or lodging that can't be explained from a significant wind event and herbicide injury, et cetera. Um, dig those roots and, and take a look, but contact myself or your seed provider 
um, because we will initiate the process of um, collecting beetles and assessing roots and determine if this is a true unexpected event and a likely resistant event. Um, and Jocelyn Smith will uh, bring those beetles back to the uh, Ridgetown campus and test on the diets to confirm whether or not um, they are resistant. So um, just make sure to contact us uh, to get the process going so we're aware. On the resistant um, theme, <laughs> which is my biggest concern this year, this one scares me too, especially the high heat that we've had uh, this past week, as well as lack of rain. Um, I'm really concerned about spider mites for both the soybean crop and the dry bean crop. We have confirmed that we have populations of dimethoate resistant uh, spider mites, which is uh, Lagon or Saigon, the most commonly used and really the only products that we use in those crops. Um, so we have a project uh, connected with Western University and Ag Canada to get a sense of what the extent of resistance is here in Ontario. Again, thanks to funding from uh, GFO. I'm thinking that in a bad year, we could see some significant yield loss. So if, if they come in late vegetative to early R stages, uh, you can see 40 to 60% yield loss as they feed on the plants and take that stress um, of the plant. And um, it really, you know, it's bad when soybean aphids don't wanna grow on uh, plants that have spider mites. Um, it, that just indicates how poor the plant health is at that point um, when they leave uh, and, and keep it for the spider mites. We do have thresholds. Um, it's really four mites per leaflet during those R stages. Um, but it also comes down to whether you're seeing plants that have signs of injury. Um, but there is a pre-harvest interval when it comes to dimethoate. So keep that in mind um, when you need to apply it. Uh, and hold off on, on if it's going to rain. Because as much as it may not knock the mites off, it does help alleviate some of the stress that the mites are causing on the plant. And can help promote um, a fungus if the humidity stays um, high. Um, and, and continues um, developing on these mites. But um, I'm concerned, given the year that we saw last year, which wasn't an ideal uh, spider mite year, we had 10 sites that had spider mites that we collected from, and all of them were resistant to dimethoate. Um, so really it's important that we pay attention to their, it, the initial spots in the field, get ahead of the situation, um, and try and figure out what our best steps are. So you will essentially start seeing mites show up at the field's edge first, usually right around wheat harvest because that's where they've been hanging out in. Um, and then wind will carry them in deeper into the field and start some pockets. But you'll start to see a little bit of stippling, looks sort of like sandblasting um, from them feeding on the individual plant uh, cells that collapse and start to um, die. But this is kind of the stage that you really want to pay attention to when you start to see the yellowing um, and the plants that, as mentioned, look like they're sandblasted. And too often people think that that's just a drought stress um, symptom, but go in and look for tiny little things, the dots moving around on the underside of the leaves, shake them on a piece of paper if you need to, um, and see if, if there are mites there. Typically, this is where you start to see some significant injury and some economic loss. When you, these plants are starting to really die off, um, you see a, a lot of stippling, especially on the lower leaves, but um, even up to the tops of the leaves. Um, this is definitely when you need to spray or you will um, uh, be at a significant yield loss. And this is too late. I often... When I'm driving, this is the one pest that you can do um, from your windshield when it's too late. <laughs> so um, I often pull over and see fields that are like this and um, clear signs that there are mites present and um, the damage is, is actually past the stage of being able to um, rescue the field. But this is my point. If in a year like this year, or even next, where it becomes more ideal for spider mites, I am really concerned. Um, it, it was 10 fields last year that really, it was moist every fourth, five day, day uh, intervals, and we still had 
some, some fields that were sprayed and it was not effective. We do have Oberon, which is another insecticide that's registered on dry beans, but it's really not cost effective. It's, it's been marketed for hort crops. And uh, because that um, product exists on dry beans, we can't get an emergency use registration for another product. We have to go through a full registration. So part of the, the reason we want to collect um, samples anywhere in the province is one, understand the distribution of where this resistant is, resistance is, but Western is also testing all the other potential active ingredients that we may potentially get registered because these mites are shared with hort crops and especially greenhouse operations too. And if they're getting exposed to those already, there's no point in us um, getting it registered if they're already developing a tolerance to them. So it's really important that we do collect these samples to, to get that understanding. And finally, in case you haven't noticed uh, this already or tried it out, uh, all of our crop protection guides in OMAFRA have moved to a digital format. So we won't be revising the field crop protection guide any longer. It will be um, here on this um, Ontario Crop Protection Hub where you can go in, select the crop, um, select the pest, and find out all the products that are available or registered for that, those uh, that particular pest on that crop. Um, and of course we can update it more frequently this way than when the publications were getting printed off. So um, I just wanted to draw your attention to the protection hub um, going forward for any of the product information that you need for these different pests. And with that, um, I just hope everyone has a decent summer <laughs> and uh, that I'm being the uh, pessimist and, and everything will actually be swell. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks so much, Tracy. That's really, um, well, not great to know, but it's really <laughs> inf important information that you've shared um, about the, the potential resistance that we might be seeing and to be on the lookout for that. I'm going to now open up the floor. I'm, I'm sure Marty and Mike also have, have some questions, so I'll, I'll let them go ahead if they do. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tracy. And, and you're not a pessimist because we, we need to have those updates on what to watch out for and what to know what's going on in the field. And and what uh, agronomists and farmers need to keep an eye on and be looking out. So we greatly appreciate the information you provided for us. I, I just want to step back a little bit with corn, with yep. the corn rootworm um, trapping network. I'm just wondering, how should farmers pick a field? Like if they are just corn after soybeans, I noticed you had a couple of soybean fields. Should they be concerned or should it just be farmers that are focused on corn on corn? And if so, how many years of corn on corn are those fields that we should be focusing on for trapping? That's a great question. So yeah, we noticed a few that went with soybeans last year and those were mainly in Essex County um, and they didn't catch anything. <laughs> so there are opportunities to try it in soybeans, especially if you are a strong corn soybean rotation. Um, we don't think the rotation variant is here in, at high levels, meaning that rootworm has developed behavior of laying eggs in soybeans so that uh, first year corn right after soybeans ends up having rootworm, but you never know. Um, it, it, there's an opportunity to gather that information in first year corn following soybeans. They'll end up in soybeans because the adults feed on anything, um, especially when it's, they're overcrowded in a cornfield, they'll go and feed on other plants. That isn't an indication that they're um, laying eggs directly in corn or directly in soybean fields. So. Um, unless we see significant numbers in first year corn following soybeans, um, I'm not too worried about that scenario. So our intention is to really focus in on continuous corn. The number of year, years in corn, it doesn't matter as much. I mean, second year on, um, of course, third and fourth and beyond is, is really high risk. And especially if you're already in an area that has frequent continuous corn. So livestock regions, um, or I will also point out those isolated pockets where you and maybe your neighbor are the one and only continuous corn grower, because you're starting to create a an isolation or island where those rootworm are looking for your field or their field almost on a regular basis. And if you're, you're using 
um, BT hybrids almost exclusively as your rootworm management strategy, then you are more prone to BT resistance as well. So, um, you know, we had a lot of participation, especially in the Huron, Perth, Bruce area. Um, but it, we would love to see more even in, in south, southwestern Ontario, where we're starting to see pockets of northern get really abundant, and central and eastern Ontario. So uh, it's fair game, but really uh, the majority should be in continuous corn so that we can identify problem fields and regions. So highly recommended anybody growing corn on corn, please put a trap out this year and monitor yeah. for this for potential sure. insect pest problem. Uh, th Absolutely. Thank you, Tracy. That's great. Just building off that from my perspective as well, Tracy, and <clears throat> curious, you know, I, I know there are a few people even in, you know, my neighborhood that are feedlot operators that have corn on corn. And honestly, it's probably close to a decade. Uh, if you're located, you know, within a concession of this, this property, I don't believe that they're going to be uh, someone that's going to put out a trap. Should you preventively do this as a way to kind of see how things are progressing within the neighborhood, I guess? Sure. Yep. Um, any any mechanism for us to at least be aware of what populations are like in any area would be great. Um, they can fly and wind can um, have them help carry them further. Um, but we also find that there's kind of a density problem where eventually they get so there's millions of beetles in one given field they need resources and if there's too many they will move out and look for other opportunities so um yeah it of course it would i'd love it to be in the guy's uh feedlot uh, acreage um but you know if you're a neighbor to them then go ahead too uh you just won't get as much if it's a if you're a, a cash cropper who rotates all, you know, across corn, soybeans, wheat, um, your populations of levels will be much lower. Um, but, you know, putting it in cornfield anyway, you'll catch something. So it, it's a good, uh, uh, at least trigger for us. And also, I think reps found it helpful to get that report at the end of the year to, to show and we kept the sites anonymous, but I did um, report to those specific reps if this was their site. Um, and they were able to take that report and, and kind of guide the grower a little further and nudge them into considering crop rotation, which was they found it very helpful to show that data um, and, and have that conversation go a little further than it would without the trap network and the data to prove it. Tracy, is there any estimate of how many corn on corn acres there are in Ontario? I know years ago, I used to think it was maybe 15 or 20 percent, but uh, yeah. I hear a lot of farmers say, no, I rotate. And with this issue now, I hear more farmers saying, yeah, I'm doing a better job of rotating, but I'm just kind of wondering, is there any, any estimates out there? Not good estimates, other than us looking at satellite imagery and trying to hone in on where high uh, corn on corn regions are. But yeah, it's fair to say 15, 10%, though, as Mike mentioned, there were sites that had 30 years of corn on corn <laughs> that entered the trap network, which is amazing. <laughs> I, like um, it, it speaks to what's the soil health when you're doing that long. There's such so much benefit from rotating out, even outside of managing rootworm, um, to just put a different crop in for a year. Um, that it floors me. I get it's inconvenient to try and switch it up, um, and there's a lot of things that are in the way. We're hoping to do an economic. Uh, analysis and case study on what those barriers are and try and show the, the benefits of moving towards this more sustainable practice of rotating at least once once every four years out of corn uh, to knock this back. Tracy, what's the time commitment from uh, receiving the traps to putting them up to monitoring them what sort of time commitment is it for a grower or an agronomist? It's not Roughly. too bad. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I would say you're looking at 30 minutes, you know, um, it depends on how far down the row you spread these out. Um, and it's messy. I won't, I won't lie. You just take a Ziploc bag to dump the um, old one 
right? And close it up before you have to look at it. Um, and you'll, I'd like to wear gloves, uh, disposable gloves to put the new ones on because it's sticky for a reason. <laughs> but um, yeah, I would say 30 minutes max, it, it, you can get it down to 15 if you um, get into the habit. And especially if you go and take the traps out and count them back at home or at the, um, at the truck uh, when, when you're at the side of the road. So overall, it is not a huge time commitment to take not, part in it. At no, all. not at all. And and while you're doing that, right, and while you're going into that field, look look at uh, look for goosenecking at the um, ground level too. And it just to me, if you do this back to back for a few years, you do start to really notice it, when beetle populations are lower or much higher than the previous year. And that will also um, tell you a lot about, you know, okay, this field, I really do need to come in every week and look uh, and uh, see if there's a problem. Great, Tracy, thank you. I know, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mari. Okay, yeah, sorry, I'm just gonna switch subject a little bit. So Tracy, okay. just thinking about an, another insect that from year to year, we kind of hear about once in a while. And when we hear about it, they, they're just troopers and they walk all over the place and it's an army worm, of course. And, um, you know, this time of year, the, the wheat's starting to fill out here in the southwest. And we're recording this on the 23rd of June. I think of the hot weather we just had. And it's like, wow, it almost seems like this is the time of year we start to hear about army worm, the heads being cut off. And I've also noticed over the years in spring cereals, when you go to eastern Ontario, same type of thing. It's maybe more than July time frame. Can you give us any indications of how we can best watch out for that and not be surprised because we always kind of hear about it in the paper afterwards about how there's just one little pocket that really got hit hard with army worm. How can we monitor for that? That's a great question. So um, we did receive pretty high flights uh, in the spring and we thought, um, especially in the states that tend to fly here, um, we thought, well, this could be a year but uh, we're not seeing it yet. We have a pretty good army of students that are monitoring, you know, six or seven yen sites each in the different regions um, to keep an eye out for both cereal leaf beetle and true army worm. And we haven't, you put a, honestly, you put research dollars into a pest and then it doesn't show up. <laughs> so, so far, so good, at least in winter cereals. Um, the fact we are starting to see a flight, a flush of moths now again, um, could potentially cause issues for spring, um, depending on how quickly the growing heat units collect in the next uh, few weeks. Um, but I think it won't be like we had it a few years ago when we had a significant outbreak. That said, you mentioned army worm. That is true army worm, fall army worm. That was a problem last fall. Um, we don't know yet, but we've increased our trap numbers in Ontario at least a bit. Uh, to monitor for that pest and see because that pest really hit the fall um, seeded crops. So we're keeping an eye again through the Great Lakes uh, Maritimes Pest Monitoring Network for that pest as well and see what it does. So traps though only tell you that they're potentially here. Um, it does mean you still have to scout the field. So, you know, given cereal leaf beetle could be an issue starting up in spring cereals right now, I suggest um, growers at least go and scout uh, once a week for a bit, especially we're getting close to uh, heading in spring cereals. Um, I, this is the time they should be watching out for other pests anyway. So keep an eye out, look, spread out the canopy and look for any frass on the um, ground or lower leaf feeding. Uh, and that may indicate to you uh, that they may be present and, and could clip off that wheat head. Um, but so far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it's good that we're monitoring and keeping an eye on that. And you know what? And if it's not an insect here, that's a good thing. I'm glad that's we're a good thing too. <laughs> They'll all be surprised if it's not an insect here. <laughs> but maybe at least not, not that pest. I just wanted to jump on really quick about the corn rootworm. We did hold, um, just for the viewers who are watching this still, um, we did hold a corn rootworm grain talk farmer forum uh, last year where yourself, Tracy, and Aaron Hodgson from the States uh, spoke on it. So if you're if they're looking for uh, more information and to hear the, the United States perspective and what they're <laughs> dealing with, that's a great resource as well to, to look for going forward. 
Um, thanks so very much, Tracy, for joining us today. We really appreciate um, the time that you've put into this and, and for all of your help across Ontario with all the growers who are, who are growing corn, soybeans, wheat, oats and barley and everything else. And uh, your knowledge is just very appreciated. No problem. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. I'm just going to share the um, QR code really quickly here. Um, for any CCAs who are, here we go.